Well, good evening and welcome to another edition of The Teaching Lady. It is Sunday at 8.30. Of course, for some of you, it feels like 9.30. I know it certainly does for me. I often struggle with this whole time change thing. I'm hungrier later. I'm tired later. And it's not time to eat yet, nor time to go to sleep. <laughs> so anyhow, tonight we dig into the book of First Thessalonians. That is a big word. But it is a book that is found in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul. And the theme of this big book, First Thessalonians, is concern for the church. It was written about A.D. 51, and it's thought that he wrote it from Corinth. But before we get started, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father, I just thank you for bringing us together tonight. I just thank you, Lord, for what your word means to me and those that are watching. And I pray, God, that if those are, uh, if there's people that are watching, Lord, and they uh, have not come to the saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, I, I pray, God, that this message and other messages will stir in their heart, Lord, and draw them closer. Uh, Father, I just leave that work to you and uh, ask you to bless our time together now. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, looking at 1 Thessalonians, it's not exactly clear how long Paul was in Thessalonica. Uh, it's a city that is in northern Greece. It could have been as little as three weeks. Uh, he there ran it kind of ran into a problem there where a mob formed and he escaped in the dark of night. And I believe uh, it says that he um, fled to Athens. Uh, still concerned for these new believers. This was relatively a new church, the church at Thessalonica. He sends his companion, Timothy, who'd been traveling around with him, to see how they're doing uh, while he travels on to Athens and uh, Corinth. Now, Timothy meets Paul in Corinth, and the book of 1 Thessalonians is the result of Timothy's good report from this new church. Let's go ahead and look at the skeleton of the book of 1 Thessalonians. You know, chapter 1, looking at Paul's evaluation of the church. And I'm going to go ahead and just read a few verses for you out of 1 Thessalonians. I love this particular part of the passage. Because it says some very key things that I think are uh, very meaningful uh, to the believers in Thessalonica. Uh, some points that Paul makes and some things that he notices. And he wants to uh, share these things with them. So let me just read to you out of verse 2 uh, going forward. It says, we always thank God for all of you. I mean, that's that's just a great way to open up a letter to the people in church. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father. And here's where, this is the part that I was talking about. He says, we remember before God our Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so their faith, their uh, work, their labor, their endurance. These, it sounds like these people were getting at it. Like they were working hard. They were enduring. They were seeing the hope, the promise. And they were excited about uh, what they were doing. He says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of our Lord, in spite of Severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. 
And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, uh, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith, uh, your faith in God has become known everywhere. I like that. We listened to a message today at church when the pastor said, you know, show... Uh, it was um, it was based on show and tell from when we were kids. We had that thing show and tell, and you could bring in your favorite thing. And he combined that with uh, algebra equation x plus y equals z. And he said, you know, the the x is show, the y is tell, and z is the people that we're supposed to be telling this to. So showing and telling what God has done to people, to others, sharing the message, okay? And the people at Thessalonica, it sounds like from chapter 1, they were sharing the message, telling about what they had learned. Uh, and that's a pretty awesome thing. And so Paul here in the very beginning saying, we, we pray about, we pray over you, we pray for you, we talk to God about you, we remember you daily. And we're so excited about the things that you're doing. This is so awesome, right? And not only did you do it here and here, but you did it everywhere. You're being known in multiple places. That's pretty cool. So the witness of the church in Thessalonica had quickly spread throughout the entire region. So much so that as Paul travels along, he has no need to say anything about the church because the people are hearing about it. And Paul takes great pride in the spiritual health of this new church uh, as seen by their missionary zeal. They were excited to share the message. You know, it begs to ask the question, are we as excited to share that same message, the gospel message? You know, they had dedication to the truth, their, con their conduct in the face of persecution, their unselfish love, and their devotion to ministry. Well, chapters 2 and 3 talk about Paul's conduct and his concern, and he reviews how he and his companion Silas and Timothy brought the gospel to those in Thessalonica, how they accepted the message, and how he longs to be with them again. Because of this ongoing concern, he again sends Timothy back to encourage them in their Christian faith, and even though Paul had earlier received positive reports on the state of this church from Timothy, he ends with a prayer for even greater growth in Christ among the Thessalonians. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's not a one-type thing. It keeps going. Now, chapters 4, 1 through 12 is Paul's exhortation to the people there. And it begins with the central thrust of Paul's message. He reminds them to continue to please God in their daily lives by avoiding sexual sin, loving one another, and living as good citizens in a secular world. You know, that it kind of reminds me, it can't be easy to live the way the Thessalonians were living in a secular world. And Paul is exhorting them, keep, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. You can do it. Look at your faith. Look how it's grown. Look how it's spread. You can do it. Keep the faith. Don't give up. Okay? And these are the things that you do. All right. Chapter 4, verse 13 through chapter 5. Uh, Paul's reminder of the believer's hope. Even though Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was brief, uh, the new church has already come to believe in and hope for the reality of their Savior's return. And Paul reminds them of the blessed hope that Jesus is coming again. Therefore, the day of the Lord can be a day of rejoicing rather than a day of judgment. And he closes with an exhortation for the people to honor their church leaders for their labor among them and for the wisdom on how they are to treat each other. And Paul ends with a benediction that God would keep them holy until Christ's return. Well, putting meat on the bones of a book like First Thessalonians, you know, a lot of people would read that and go, 
how do I apply this to my life? What does that mean to me? You know, this is great that all those people in Thessalonica, they got it, they were doing it, they seem to be on the right path, but they haven't experienced what I've experienced. They, they don't live in today's society, in today's world with social media and all these things uh, at our fingertips. And uh, how do we apply a book like this to our lives? And that's what we want to talk about, putting meat on the bones, fleshing it out in our own lives and life lessons on the book of Thessalonians. You know, the Thessalonian Christians are living in the expectation that Christ is going to return. And Paul has taught them that Christ's second coming is a culmination of redemptive history. And for that reason, they do not want to miss it. And Timothy brings back news that they're concerned because some of the Christians among them have already died. So there was concern among the people that some of them in their, in their group there in Thessalonica had passed on already and they were going to miss Christ's return. And Paul is reassure, reassuring them that those that have gone on already will be reunited with those that are living and uh, both will see Christ again. So if we know someone who has passed on, if they were, we'll see Je when Jesus returns, okay, the dead in Christ shall rise. Those that are living shall rise, okay? It will, we're not going to miss that should we perish before Christ returns, should he tarry, as they say. So Paul informs them that the deceased believers will not miss out. They have not missed out on Jesus' return. And he assures them that even the dead will participate in Christ's return. That's great news. Well, fleshing it out in our own lives, you know, the thing is no one knows when Christ is going to return. We've had lots of people uh, give us estimates based on math that they've done, based on studying certain scriptures and putting things together and working it like a puzzle. And working it like a math equation and adding this and adding that and taking this away and looking at life events and looking at world events and things that have happened. And we've had many people that have come forward and said the end of the world is going to be today. Uh, it's going to be here. It's going to be here and get a lot of people worked up and upset. And then that day comes and nothing happens. They go on by. It goes that we're still here. And so the important thing to remember and what I always tell myself is I don't know when the end of the world is coming. The Bible tells me we will not know the day or the hour, but that it will come like a thief in the night. And the Bible also tells me that I got to be ready. Okay, I don't want to be, there was the story of the 10 virgins and five of them had oil in their lamps and the other five didn't. And when it was time, the five that had the oil in their lamps were ready to go. They were ready, and they went. The five that didn't went out to try and find oil, and when they came back, it was too late. And, of course, they wanted the oil from the five that were ready, and they said, we can't share our oil with you. You should have been ready. We, you, You've been warned. You've been told. Prepare. Be ready. Always be ready. Well, that's us today. We have to be ready for Christ's return. Could happen at any time. It could happen tonight, next week, next month, 10 years from now, 20 years. We don't know. See, we have to live as though Christ could return at any moment. We have to be ready. Now, does that mean we sit on a, you know, bite all our fingernails off and we go, I'm, I, I got, no, he doesn't want it. He wants us to live a full and complete life each and every day but living for him in anticipation that he's going to return. You know, and Paul is reminding the, the believers there, don't get upset about the people that have already gone on through death. Believers with, um, alive and, and deceased will rise up to meet Christ one day when he returns. But while we are still living, we are to be prepared. We are to uh, continue to grow. We are to continue to uh, be molded and shaped, allow God to mold us and shape us into who he wants us to be. Continue to work on our relationship with the Lord. Continue to draw closer to him. Okay, 
being in his word, reading the scripture, talking to God on a daily basis, trying to shed that old self and take on new Christ-like qualities. Okay, being prepared because we don't know the day or the hour of Christ's return. Now, a lot of people would say, well, I just don't believe that he's ever going to return. I can't, uh, I could just tell you what I, what I believe and why I believe it. I believe the Bible to be true. I believe it because of what God has done in my life. I have seen what he's done. I have seen how he's changed me. I've lived it. And I look at his scripture and I said, that's what you've done in my life, Lord. Those things you have done, you have showed yourself to me. You have been molding and changing me into who you want me to be. I have a story to tell and so I tell it, right? And so that's something that we have to do to help other people. You know, it was very interesting today at church. There was a guy that was on a YouTube video uh, who was an atheist. And he said, how, and I, and I won't get it 100% right, but he said, how much do you, I think it was, how much do you hate somebody that you would not tell them about Jesus Christ and what he could do for you? Even if they receive it terribly, how much do you dislike or hate another human being that you would not, tell them something so important you know and the example he used was if i saw an oncoming truck and that truck was headed for you would i not try to warn you or rescue you or pull you out of the way how much do i hate you if i'm just going to stand there and watch the truck just hit you right and he had a point how much do we love one another Enough to tell them the good news of the gospel. Do we not love people enough to tell people our story about what God has done in our lives? And pastor said, he goes, you know, make it a 60 second speech. 60 seconds tell what God has done for you and why you believe in Jesus Christ. Tell them. 60 seconds. Now, of course, you all know me. I talk way longer than 60 seconds. But the point of the matter is, is that I love you enough to tell you what God has done for me. I love you enough to, to sit here night after night and share what Christ has done in my life. I love you enough. I want you to know the truth. I don't want anyone to perish without knowing Jesus. I love you enough to tell you because I want to see you in heaven too. That's why I do what I do. That's why I share the gospel with people. That's why I record these videos. That's why I post stuff online. Because I care and I love you. And, you know, he, he made a very good point today in that, you know, how much do I... If, if I'm not sharing my story, do I love you enough to watch you go to hell? And, you know, and it was it was just a very enlightening uh, message today. He had, he had a point. And uh, the guy that was interviewed, you know, he said, you couldn't help it. I mean, he, he said, here I am, an atheist. And this guy was just looked me straight in the eye and said, hey, man. You need to know. He's like, it's like a truck coming at somebody. I need to pull them out of the way. You know, and who knows what will happen with that particular person. I don't know. But, you know, Paul is saying, don't, don't give up. Because there is a hope. Christ is going to return. And we don't know when. But don't give up that hope of Christ's return. That is something we as believers put our hope in. You know, I often say, if I didn't have Jesus to put my hope in, what would I be putting my hope in? Another person, money, material things, stuff that's going to disappoint. 
stuff that's going to disappoint me and let me down. How can I say that? Because I've been in that position. I put my hope in materialism, things that let me down, people that let me down, uh, people that, you know, just rocked my world with hurt and pain. It wasn't until I connected with Jesus and rededicated my life to him many years ago that I found that's who I put my hope in and he doesn't let me down. He hasn't let me down, nor will he let me down. I've had ex experienced a lot of growth from that point, from where I was then to where I am now. Yes, a lot of this because trying to straighten out my life and get rid of the old stuff and take on more Christ-like qualities is, well, quite honestly, it's not an easy thing to do. But I have Christ, I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me to help me do that on a day-to-day -day basis. I was telling a girl today, I said, you know how long it's taken me to get where I'm at right now? In my relationship with Jesus, we're talking 14 to 15 years. Years. It didn't happen overnight. This transformation doesn't happen overnight. But as I told her today, I said, you got to start somewhere. And if you don't ever start, then you're missing out on the abundant life. And you can have the abundant life. And I know she kind of looked at me and she said, I'm in work release. Yes, right now you are. But you're going to get out. And it doesn't matter. The abundant life can start today in work release. It could start today wherever you're at. Work release, jail, wherever you're watching from. The abundant life can start today. Hope in a resurrected Savior can start today. See, we don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until you got all these things figured out. Because guess what? As I figured out, you don't figure them all out at the same. You don't figure them all out. You need help figuring them out. You know, I needed help figuring them out. So, um, something to consider. Well, back to no one knowing when Christ returns. One day, all believers, both those who are alive and those who have died, will be united with Christ. Daily anticipation of his return should comfort you as you deal with the everyday trials and tribulations. <laughs> know that there is a good thing coming. Okay, is essentially what Paul's saying. A good thing is coming. Okay, having that hope, looking forward to the day. This is our temporary home. Heaven is a permanent place. This is our temporary home. Uh, and so looking forward to that day, ah, uh, Knowing that Christ will return should motivate us to live a holy and productive life. Uh, and that's something, as I mentioned earlier, on uh, some ways on how to do that. So live in expectation of Christ's return at any moment and do not be caught unprepared. You know, I often think, how many people are going to be surprised? How many people are going to go, you know... Jeanette was talking about that, and I didn't believe her. I just chalked it up to she was she didn't know what she's talking about, and she has a right to believe what she believes. I I had a, a young person tell me not too long ago. He says, you know, you have a right to believe that. That's your interpretation. And I thought, you know, I hope that as as I'm still praying for praying for this person. Uh, I hope that that is going to change for him and that one day he'll see and realize, like I did, that that's where hope is, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, uh, self-control, where eternal life comes in, where I'll spend eternity. Eternity is a long time. That's a long time. It's infinite, isn't it? It's infinity, and you know, it's like Buzz Lightyear says, infinity and beyond, <laughs> right? Eternity is a long time. I want to make sure that I'm spending it in the right place. 
you know, and, and I realize that there's people out there who say, look, I, I had a young lady, 24 years old. She told me one day, she goes, Doobie, look, here's the deal. I'm going to die one day. And I'm going in the ground. Period. The end. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. I'm just going in the ground. When I die one day, that's my deal. Right? But yet this young lady always came to me knowing that I was a prayerful person. When she had problems, she always came to me. I just found that very interesting. She knew I was a praying person. She knew where I stood in regards to Christ. And yet she would come to me every time she had a problem. And I speak in past tense because it was not even a year after that conversation that she had some freak accident happen with her car and she passed away in her home by herself. Broke my heart. Because this young lady I had known for many years and she would come up to me all the time because we worked together and she would come up to me all the time and want to talk about problems that she was having, struggles that she was having. And I'd say, you know, if we pray about it, she goes, I know you're a praying person. I know. Why do you keep coming to me if you know that's what I'm going to say, right? Something in that relationship was drawing her in. She knew I was a praying person. And I wasn't going to beat her over the head with it. I never did. But she knew, and she'd go, yes, I know, you're going to pray for me. Yes, I am going to pray for you. It's why you came, really. I mean, really, it's why you came. But, you know, I'll always remember the words that she said to me about, Doobie, I'm just going to die and go in the ground. And I, and I, and I just, when she said it, I'm like, that she, I know you believe in heaven and you believe in hell. You believe that there's a hell. Yes, I do. And I don't want you to spend eternity there. I'm not going to spend eternity anywhere except in the ground. Well, to this day, and it's been three years, I don't know where she's spending eternity, and I won't know till I get to heaven myself. I hope that through our conversations that we used to have, that somewhere in that year that went by, she had a conversation with the Lord and changed her stance on that and became a Christ follower. Um, I hope she did, but I won't know until I meet the Lord Jesus myself. But So it's important that we consider and that we know where are we going And looking at other people and going, we need to be telling other people about what Christ has done for us. Make it that 60 second, here's what Christ has done for me. Here's how he changed changed my life. And here's how he can change yours. And he can change yours too. If you're willing. If you're willing. It doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. And it doesn't matter what you're going through now and who you are now. Because that's the awesome thing about Christ. When I look back at my life and I go, what a mess. I was a train wreck. I was a train wreck. My life was such a mess. And yet Jesus still wanted me as I was right then. And that's what he wants from you. He wants you as you are. He's saying, look at the woman at the well. Five husbands and the guy that she was with then was not even her husband. And Jesus still talked to her and said, go get your husband. She goes, well, he's not my husband. He goes, yeah, I know. You've had five husbands and the guy you're with now is not your husband. And I'm still talking to you. And I'm still telling you I am the Messiah that you've been looking for. I'm he that you just told me you know is going to come. Well, I'm he. Still talking to the woman at the well, despite 
her baggage and all her sin. Pretty cool, if you ask me. So we can come up with a million reasons as to why we can't come to faith in Christ at that moment. Because we got this, and we got this, and we got this, and we got this, and I got a whole laundry list of stuff. I had a whole laundry list of stuff. Eh. We can come to Christ now. He is ready and waiting for you. And the question is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? For everything to be perfect? (laughs) I got news for you. It's never going to be perfect. If anything, things are just continuing to just go bloop, 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 downhill. Don't wait any longer. Don't delay any longer what you could do today. All right, well, life lessons from Thursday, uh, Thursday, <laughs> First Thessalonians. I tell you this name, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, you are to esteem and honor your church leaders. Your testimony is a powerful witnessing tool. It's our story, you know. Our testimony is our story, and no one can take that away from us. You can't take my story away. It's my story, and we all have a story. Godly living is going to evoke persecution. That's just going to happen. I had, uh, I'll share with you real quickly. I had a post on something, some website, a year, uh, over a year ago. I shared something on a on a uh, page. And I got an email back three weeks ago telling me what a crackhead I was. I was completely delusional. I lost my mind. I need therapy. And I'm a pathological liar. Now those of you that know me, would any of those things describe me? I sure hope not. But this person just, one after the other, just tried to hang me out there to dry with... And she didn't have one positive thing to say. And and the thing is, is that conversation took place a year ago. And it wasn't even directed. It was a general response on a web page. And somehow she got my email and emailed me all of that wonderfully nasty stuff. Just totally berating me. And telling me I've completely lost my mind. And you know, that can, that can hurt. Uh, And and that can really kind of discourage you. That's persecution. You know, that's a form of persecution. It doesn't always have to be physical. There can be some mental, uh, verbal uh, persecution that takes place when you are sharing your story about what Christ has done for you. That kind of stuff can happen. And that was really the first time that I experienced somebody just totally coming unglued on me because of my belief. And uh, of course, you know, your, your instinct sometimes is just to respond after it. I'm like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to even... I'm not, I'm, there's no way I'm even going to justify that with a response or an answer because there's no trying to convince that person right now. I'm going to let God take care of that. You know, revenge is mine, says the Lord. It's his. I'm going to let him take care of it. Obviously, there's something going on there, and it's his. I turn her over to him, and I'm not going to... Uh, send her an email and try and respond or any of that. I just pray and say, Lord, you know what? You got this one. You got this one. And lastly, the promised return of Christ should motivate all of us to holy living. Does the return of Christ motivate you in any way? Or have you even thought about the return of Christ? Remember what I talked about earlier. You know, we have to be ready because Christ could return at any time. I absolutely believe that. I don't know when it is. I don't sit and line up all the stars and do the calculations. Because when Jesus told me, you're not going to know the hour or the day or the time. All he told me was, you need to be ready at all times. And so that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to do. So and in the meantime, he tells me, go and make disciples 
and share the gospel message. So I'm doing, trying to be obedient. Two things, being ready and telling my story. Sharing the message with people so that they too can get ready, ask questions, do whatever it takes for them to draw closer to the Lord. Um, because after all, I mean, like I said earlier, I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you in heaven. You know, we were laughing the other day. We were laughing the other day when we were talking about heaven. And, and um, well, I don't, I don't know why I'm getting teary right now. It's going to be a great thing to see people there. That we haven't seen. And. There's going to be people there that we go. Whoa. <laughs> I never thought you'd make it man. But you're here. Awesome. And there's going to be others that go. Where is so and so. Wow. I thought they'd be here. Wow. I thought they'd make it. But, you know, something to think about. <laughs> well, I better go. <laughs> I don't know why I get... I don't know. Thinking about that. Well, I'm going to go. And I'll talk to you later. <laughs>